So good morning, folks. My name is Deb Breen. I'm the director for the Centre for Teaching and Learning. And I welcome you to the fifth session of our AI information series, co-hosted by Digital Learning and Innovation and the Centre for Teaching and Learning. Our focus today is on generative AI and learning assessment, a great topic at any time, but I think particularly timely at this point in the semester. Um, next slide, please. So before we get underway, just some housekeeping. So um, the information session is recorded and it will be up on the DLNI site later this month. Live transcription is also enabled. And uh, if you click on the CC icon in your toolbar, that will give you a transcription as the speakers talk. And next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to ask Cindy Vincent, the Manager of Communications for Digital Learning and Innovation, to tell you about how uh, Q&A is going to work. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. So in this session today, we'll be using Zoom's Q&A feature. At the bottom of your toolbar below, you'll see an icon for Q&A. Anytime during today's session, you can click on that box and enter your questions that you have for our panelists and speakers today. Um, the way that we uh, run our Q&A is by um, bubble up or filter up. So basically at the top of that Q&A box, there will be an option for you to sort by relevance, not relevance, sorry, um, by chronology. So when they're entered or by liked or, or upvoted, most upvoted. And so throughout the session, you can also like a question to make sure that we absolutely answer those questions during today's Q&A session at the end. Um, yeah, I believe that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. And also, I just want to acknowledge uh, Sam McChris, who is helping with the slides today, and also Leah DeSar for background help. So this is very much a collective effort, both in terms of the, the presenters who are here today, but also the support staff. So thanks very much. So Sam, next slide, please. So folks, we have a great range of speakers uh, today uh, to sort of help us understand uh, and think about uh, AI and assessment. So let me welcome them all and thank them for their time. And I'll introduce each of them in turn. This is just so that we can, uh, you know, get to see everyone at once. So first up, Sam, next slide, please. So let me welcome Chris Delarocas, the Associate Provost for Digital Learning and Innovation and the Richard C. Shipley Professor of Information Systems at the Questrom School of Business. And Chris is going to give us an overview of how to approach learning assignments in the age of AI. Thank you, Deb. Good morning, everybody. Sam, next slide, please. Before we pass on the baton to my colleagues who will share with you what they're actually doing in their classroom this semester, I thought that I would propose a framework for approaching the question of rethinking assignments in the era of AI. As educators, our main goal is to help our students develop uh, new abilities, competencies, skills, however you want to call them, that will make them more successful in the world. We call that our learning outcomes. So when we are approaching an assignment, I propose that we first go back to first principles. We remind ourselves what are the core learning outcomes that this assignment is meant to assess and or help develop. And before we go any further, we also do a reality check. We ask whether these outcomes are still relevant in their current form in a world of ubiquitous generative AI tools or whether some sort of revision is needed. Just to give you an example, when calculators came into the picture, uh, knowing the process of doing certain arithmetic operations as, as a competency became less important. However, students still needed to have a good sense of the magnitudes uh, and, and other properties of numbers so that they could assess whether the results were um, correct. So we needed to revise, but not abandon that outcome. Next click, please. So once we decide what are the learning outcomes, we can go further. We can start thinking, how could generative AI enhance the development and assessment of those outcomes? And this can lead us to various ways for integrating generative AI into the assessment. 
Uh, in contrast, it's also important to think how generative AI might hinder the development and assessment of those outcomes, and that will lead us to think in various ways of mitigating those possibilities. Finally, because we're still at the stage where the world is coming to, in, you know, to is, is, is coming to terms with this new technology, we have an opportunity and perhaps an obligation uh, to help our students advance their AI literacy. So it's something that we should also be thinking when we are rethinking our assignments. Next slide, please. So in terms of mitigating the use of AI, uh, this is a, a non-exclusive list of some of the things I've seen people try out. Well, one idea, one important idea is if you really want students to make sure that they don't use AI inappropriately when they do an activity that will help them develop some ability or competency, well, make sure you do it in class. So flipping the classroom and using your class time to uh, get your students to do, because we learn by doing, remember, certain activities that are important for them to develop certain uh, competencies is, is an important strategy. For the same reason, conducting oral examinations, presentations, and discussions is an interesting mitigation strategy for assessing students' competencies. The next set of ideas uh, has to do with motivations. Uh, maybe uh, rethink your assessment so that you reduce people's motivation to use AI inappropriately. Avoid high stakes assessments, uh, re replace them with frequent low stakes assessments seems to work well and one of our presenters will comment on this. Also focus on process over product, ask students to provide a, um, let's say a document and a, a journal of all the different steps of coming up with the final outcome of an assignment is another way that will both reduce their motivation to use AI inappropriately, and also um, will really perhaps in some ways give you a sense of how their abilities and competencies are evolving. So finally, I have some ideas that I've seen. I put them in italics because these ideas uh, are based on the current uh, shortcomings of generative AI tool. And personally, I don't think that these are very stable because those tools have new capabilities all the time. So I've seen some faculty base assignments on images and, 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 and graphs because current AI tools don't do very well with images and graphs as input, but this is changing. Um, also, as you know, uh, some AI tools are trained on, on data which has an expiration date and ChatGPT famously is based on data which ends in 2021. So uh, some people try to base assignments on recent events. Again, this can be circumvented by asking the AI tool to read. Uh, something that, you know, describes the current event. And then there's this idea of having more authentic assignments, assignments that are based on, or on personal experiences. Again, there are ways to get around them. But, you know, I put them in the list. Next slide, please. Now, when it comes to integrating AI into assignments, um, a general set of ideas is encouraging users, students to use AI to get started to do some initial research, idea generation, or overview. And then it asks them to go further, you know, to try to improve the um, output of AI themselves. So I've seen assignments that are asking students to explain, critique, or augment AI's output. And you, you will hear some examples from our colleagues today. Uh, important also because as we all know, AI is not always correct right, is to develop the, the ability and competency to fact check AI's output, assess bias, and also help provide sources. And the general idea of asking students to document and reflect on the evolution of their work, the idea of process versus product, is a great idea that works with or without AI. So ask students to give you the initial output of AI and then to give you a journal that, that lists all the steps and all the successive augmentations or improvements they have made on this initial output. And the final idea, which, which I've seen articulated and it's actually quite ambitious, is to rethink your assignments and ask students to use AI and then to give them an assignment that asks them to do more than you used to. So if you used to ask them to write a 
a chapter of a business plan, now ask them to use AI and produce a complete business plan. If you ask them to uh, program a part of the system, now ask them to use AI and then pr produce the entire system. I mean, this is the idea because eventually, I mean, actually not eventually, already AI is a major productivity tool uh, that allows people to do more in less time. So as I mentioned, these are not um, comprehensive lists as we become more acquainted with the technology. I'm sure that we'll be finding other ways, but it's a good starting point. Um, and at this point, I would like to thank you for your attention. Maybe move to the next slide. And I would like to pass the button on to my, to my colleagues who will tell you what they've actually been doing uh, this semester. Yeah. So thank you, Chris, for framing our conversation today. And we're going to see examples of both mitigation and integration uh, in the following talks. So next slide, please, Sam. So our next speaker is Tal Gross, the Associate Professor for Markets, Public Policy and Law in Questrom School of Business. And Tal is giving us an overview of how he enhances learning via frequent low stakes AI generated testing. Tal, over to you, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, so if you would please turn to the next slide. Uh, so like a good academic, I wanna start with peer reviewed research. This is a meta study that was done recently and published in a good uh, educational psychology journal that asked how quizzes uh, affect students' performance. Let's see the rest of the slide. Thank you. So here's a quote. Class quizzes are a useful teaching tool. Instructors can expect them moderately to improve average student performance and learning to help themselves and their students gauge how well the students are grasping the material and how well they will perform on final exams and even possibly to reduce the number of students who do not pass their class. So that's the take on an analysis of a bunch of randomized trials or evaluations of adding, incorporating cumulative quizzes into classes on top of a midterm and a final exam. And uh, what's interesting is that this process seems to work well for students. They're hungry for practice questions anyways, so you give them low stakes quizzes, and uh, especially if they're cumulative quizzes, there's something called the spacing effect and the retrieval effect then having to, to respond to uh, questions about the same content over and over again, it leads itself to the uh, content sticking. And the challenge here is that it's hard to write these quizzes. Um, you're already writing a midterm and a final exam and you have to put together practice questions. Uh, it's hard to put together a quiz every week, especially when you're creating a class de novo. And this is where ChatGPT can help. So please turn to the next slide. Here's a prompt that I've been experimenting with. You are an excellent instructor of MBA students. Review the following exported text from a slide deck for class and create 10 multiple choice questions. And then I give it some more instructions about the kind of multiple choice questions I want, but it's basically, I'm giving ChatGPT either my notes or else my slides exported to text and just pasting it right in and asking it to create questions. Uh, next slide. So here's one question that it created. I think this is a decent question given the, the content I have. It created 10 of these, half of them were, were lousy garbage questions. So I just ignored them right away. The other half were okay. I had to edit, I had to vet the content, but it, it saved me a lot of time. And even if ChatGPT has only got like a 5% hit rate or a 1% hit rate in terms of the quality of the questions, that's still fine because you can keep it regenerating. It'll create as many questions as you want. So um, this is a tool that can take uh, a lot of the edge off when you have to create quizzes. Next slide. You can also give it a PDF. This is the this is me using a plugin on ChatGPT. So uh, if you see at the bottom, uh, the PDF appears to be a slide presentation for a managerial economics course. And the first session covers the following topics. So the, the system is reading my slides as a PDF and is then kind of understanding, quote unquote, understanding, I'm not a computer scientist, understanding uh, the, the content, and then it creates multiple choice questions for me. Uh, so either you export your content to plain text and paste it in, which is the easiest thing to do, or try to get it to, to read PDFs, which sometimes is a little tedious and requires a plug-in. And so this is a little tricky. It's going to get even easier. Next slide, please. 
Blackboard is integrating ChatGPT into uh, its software through what they call the AI Design Assistant, uh, which is currently in beta. Let me show you what this looks like next. Uh, so here's a menu that should look familiar to you if you ever use Blackboard Ultra, but there's this new option here, auto-generate modules, next. And so it pops up this window and you've got these two sliders here where you can select the complexity of the questions. Uh, and then it creates a quiz for you based on the content you've already put into Blackboard just by using the system. Next. It adds a flag. This is auto-generated content and needs to be checked for accuracy and bias. So you still need a review and it actually is, is telling you to review the content. The a lot of the questions are gonna be lousy, uh, but a few of the questions will be helpful and it's easy to edit. And it's now all in one window rather than what we all have to do today, which is copy and paste from a separate window like animals. Uh, Blackboard is going to make this even easier. So this feature is currently in beta. I played around a little bit with it uh, recently because I had access to the beta version. I believe that later this month, the, the this is going to leave beta. And then as soon as BU updates Blackboard, we'll have access to this uh, within the system. Next slide. So in, in terms of big thinking, uh, you know, I got these words from Chris. They've already been mentioned today. There's integration and mitigation. So next in terms of integration, I'm creating low stakes quizzes uh, with generative AI. They're gonna be graded for completion only so that the students don't get upset and to keep it um, to keep it palatable. So that I encourage them then to just take the quizzes without notes, closed book, without talking to uh, a friend. Uh, and the answers are gonna be given to them right away. So they get feedback immediately. And so it's really low stakes. They only, uh, they just get hundred percent so long as they take the quiz. And if they're really in a rush, then you know, just choose randomly, who cares? But this is a way for them to have practice questions. And I think I can still look at the, the average scores to get a sense of how things are going. Next. In addition, we can all use AI to help design the course. Now, our uh, expertise as instructors is definitely relevant. The system's not gonna replace us entirely, but occasionally maybe you have 10 minutes in class you need to fill, or maybe you're looking for another active learning exercise. AI can be used uh, in terms of ideation, in terms of coming up with exercises, questions, and so forth. You can just give it learning objectives. And if you've written good learning objectives or learning goals, then the system can, can come up with ideas for you. Next. And then in terms of mitigation, I'm going to be uh, running my exams with ExamSoft, which is a software system that allows students to use their own uh, laptops, but they can't access the internet. Uh, and so either that or else blue books, uh, old fashioned pen and paper exams, I think is the way to go uh, so that, you know, they can, um, we can still assess their, their knowledge without uh, contamination from generative AI. Next. And then also I use group presentations. The students are free to use AI to help prepare for the presentation. In fact, eventually I think ChatGPT is going to be incorporated into Microsoft PowerPoint. So it'll be kind of silly to encourage students to create a presentation without generative AI. But at the end of the day, they're graded on the presentation, which is just them in front of the class with their slide deck. And you have to take responsibility for the material. You can't say, this is just what ChatGPT provided. That's not how it works. Uh, it's your material and your presentation. Next. So uh, this is a my last prompt here. Uh, next, this is a picture. parts of class that are uh, where our, our expertise is most valuable and outsourcing some of the boring stuff, the tedious stuff to chat GPT uh, and then supervising it, vetting the questions, so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tal. That was really great, uh, that framing uh, of the discussion uh, into uh, low stakes assignments. And I especially love the image at the end with its encouraging prompt. Um, you know, I'm not so sure that the actual image answered the prompt in quite the same kind of positive way, but it still, it was really interesting to see. So um, thank you so much. So uh, let's go on to um, our next speaker. So Chris McVeigh, Senior Lecturer in the Writing Program, College of Arts and Science, is actually not able to be with us today because he's teaching right now. 
But he is so interested in using ChatGPT in classes that he made a short video for us to watch. And Chris asks, can ChatGPT make students better writers? So over to Chris for his recorded comments. Hi, my name is Chris McVeigh, and I'm a senior lecturer with the writing program here at Boston University. This semester, I'm experimenting with allowing students to use generative AI for their coursework. And today I'd like to share some takeaways from the experience so far. Can ChatGPT make students better writers or does it allow them to cut corners and prevent them from learning? My course policy, the longer version of which is available through the link shared at the end of this video, is designed to create a balance, limiting students from using ChatGPT for more than 50% of their submitted writing and requiring that they both cite its use and highlight AI-generated text in blue font. I also emphasize that students must take full responsibility for any work they submit, including and especially if AI-generated content is wrong, offensive, or even just poorly written and poorly integrated. At the start of the semester, I surveyed students about how they were already using AI for their classes. Many self-reported that they are using it in many different ways, even for classes in which there are AI policies that ban the use of ChatGPT for submitted work. Rather, students use it to plan or brainstorm ideas, even if they do the writing themselves. They also use it to summarize long readings, to prepare flashcards, and to prep for exams or quizzes. So one big takeaway here is that students are using ChatGPT, even if that use is not obvious to us or apparent in their writing and coursework. Second, I've been surprised that, for my class, students often never reach the full 50% of ChatGPT's allowed use in their writing. It tends to hover around 25 to 30%, and students use it for what they perceive to be the more algorithmic or boring parts of their writing that they don't want to do. Things like conclusions, transitions, summaries of concepts, and so on. They also use it as an advanced form of Grammarly, in which they can ask it to improve style and grammar, or to change sentences and paragraphs in specific ways. And third, the class and I agree that current MLA conventions for citing generative AI are simply inadequate. MLA asks writers to treat generative AI as a research conduit, but its citation protocols actually seem to regard AI as a kind of author or source. Moreover, it requires writers to cite the prompt used to generate the text or the information. But often that prompt is meaningless and decontextualized because it derives from a much longer conversation. For example, the student cited prompt would be, say that again in less than 200 words. The students and I both agree that the approach of highlighting AI-generated text, however, has been more useful than conventional citations. AI certainly presents challenges to assessment. When students are allowed to use ChatGPT for their work, to what extent are we assessing ChatGPT, and to what extent are we assessing students' actual knowledge and writing abilities? At the same time, generative AI will increasingly change how we all write in our personal and professional lives, and we may soon find it integrated into our browsers and other tools that we use to find information. Despite the challenges it poses to assessment, I think we have a responsibility to help students learn how to use AI well and to use it wisely. In my own class, I found that talking with students about how they're using ChatGPT or generative AI has actually made them more deliberate and self-aware in their own writing. I don't think I'll ever allow them to use it for 100% of their work, but I do plan to allow its use in limited ways. If you'd like to see my longer AI policy on the syllabus, it's available in this link. Thanks, everyone. And moving on, thank you so much to Chris for that thoughtful um, overview of his findings uh, in the semester in terms of integrating AI into his class. And I think, uh, you know, what was interesting between Chris's presentation and Tal's sort of final thoughts uh, is that notion of how we adapt. Um, so uh, let's go to our next presenter. Um, Margaret Wallace is Associate Professor of the Practice in Film and Television in the College of Communication. And Margaret's going to tell us about her assignment, Interactive Fiction Using AI, with a focus on process. Hi, everybody. I, I think we can advance to the next slide. 
Um, yeah, so my name is Margaret Wallace and uh, I've been, uh, I'm a um, professor of the practice at the College of Communication, specifically in the Department of Film and Television, where I teach classes on um, media innovation, uh, uh, fundamentals of interactive media, which is the subject of, of this um, discussion today. And I also teach a class on the video games industry. Um, my background is in the tech industry and also as an entrepreneur and video game developer. So you can imagine that um, uh, the topic of uh, generative AI is uh, something that's uh, near and dear to my heart. So one of the classes that I teach here at the College of Communication is called the Fundamentals of Interactive Media. Um, depending on the semester, I will teach this class um, for my either for my um, uh, Media Ventures graduate students, so uh, graduate students who come to the College of Communication to focus specifically on themes of media innovation uh, and product creation. Uh, and then some semester, uh, other semesters, I teach this class to undergraduates, and the undergraduates are primarily comprised of film and television students. The course itself focuses on, as you can see here, the history and evolution of interactive media and related technologies. So we, we really start at the beginning. Uh, we talk about um, uh, you know, uh, the evolution of the internet, uh, the World Wide Web. We talk about the evolution of social networks. We certainly focus on um, video games, uh, simulations. And then uh, later in the semester, we, we uh, do focus on topics related to uh, XR, extended reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality. So what, what I really feel is incumbent, incumbent upon me um, for this uh, course is to give people a wide breadth. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So, um, so as you can imagine, given the student um, makeup that I described to you just now, um, you know, there are various uh, levels of skill and comfort that the students bring with them to this course in terms of actually uh, creating a piece of interactive media, because I think it's really important to augment the discussion that we have with these four types of media innovations with some hand on hands on practice. So I created a, an assignment, which is basically where I ask students to create what is essentially a branching nonlinear narrative. It's a choose your own adventure type uh, uh, story. It can be uh, something that they've written themselves. It can be a news article. It can be a piece of fiction that's in the public domain that they may, may wish to modify. And they're invited to use Twine, um, which is an open source tool, very easy to use, to create a pretty brief story with five to eight uh, branches, um, hopefully uh, focusing on meaningful choices for the user to progress through the story, and three unique uh, endings. Next slide, please. And so um, students have the option to use ChatGPT. And I wanted to just quickly mention, I. I incorporate um, lectures about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, generative AI in, in every single class I take. I spend at least one class talking about the difference between artificial general intelligence, artificial narrow intelligence, and what we mean by machine learning. And so for this assignment, um, if students do elect to use ChatGPT as an option, because I do want to create a, a, a situation where they are encouraged to be familiar with um, and comfortable using generative AI, students are asked to generate five to 10 prompts um, to either refine and customize the story or to generate the twine code. The students are required to keep track of and share the prompts used indicate which version of GPT that they use. And if they want to add an image component, they also have that option. Next slide, please. Um, and then uh, for the assessment, I look at how they, um, the thought process they use for the construction of the prompts, what process they used, if any, to yield better results, uh, the final product, um, the final interactive story, and then asking them to, to reflect on what their experience was like using generative AI for this purpose. Next slide, please. Uh, the big picture is I believe we are um, on the precipice of what everyone um, or a lot of folks call the fourth industrial revolution. 
And I think it's just essential for folks who consider themselves to be technical or not, to be familiar with um, using generative AI um, as practitioners, because it's increasingly going to be part of our lives, either uh, on a personal basis or in terms of our, our career experiences. And that's, that's pretty much uh, what I do for this uh, one particular assignment. And I'm gonna continue to refine it uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret, for this discussion. I love the way it, it included process, imagination and reflection. And I'm hoping we'll come back to that in the Q&A time. So let's go on to our next presenter, um, who's familiar to us as an early adopter here at um, BU. So uh, Professor Wesley Wildman, Professor of Philosophy, Theology and Ethics in the Faculty of Computer and Data Sciences. And Wesley is going to tell us about how he integrates AI into class projects. Welcome everyone, good to be with you. We could go to the next slide. So this is one example of a class project that makes good use of Gen AI tools. The point of this, I'm going to walk you through it. The point of it is several fold. I want students to learn how to deepen their generative AI skills. And to that end, I want them to get really good at prompt engineering. I want them to use multiple modes of AI. I want them to generate videos and images and text and so on. I also want them to explore new apps. So we actually explore apps in class and they can get an idea of the sorts of things that, that, we, that they can do. Second, I want them to understand the limits of Gen AI capabilities by doing their best to create something and then being forced to live with the results. And thirdly, I want to use Gen AI, I want them to use Gen AI to create superior understanding and production. So in other words, to deepen their learning. So we do this using a multi-step project, which is a, a, the very same project that runs throughout the entire semester. An interesting concept. First, the students propose a topic. It has to be enough detail to get a green light from the professor. That's something that we would normally do with an essay topic or a project. And then they do an analyzed, annotated literature review on that topic, freely using generative AI. It has to be annotated. So they actually have to produce those annotations, not just a list. And not very often, uh, Gen AI can help with that. In the third step, it's uh, this is an ethics class. So people are trying to figure out what the ethics point of their project is. And it's possible to get all tangled up in details and forget that you're actually writing an ethics project. So they have to write an ethics touch point statement. They get class feedback on that. They get instructor feedback and they can freely use AI to do that. In the fourth step, they're supposed to produce a public speech on their topic. But this is 100% gen AI and they're absolutely not allowed to do any line editing. They can piece together different bits of AI, but they're not allowed to do any line editing to knit together things and make them smooth. So I want them to feel the, the difficulty in getting Gen AI to do exactly what you want. Now, that gives people a chance to figure out how to improve their prompts, of course, which is great. And then they get feedback from the class on their speech, and they get feedback from the instructor. And the grades aren't rewarding the content of the speech. It's rewarding creative prompt engineering. The fifth step, the formal outline of the project, again, a fairly normal thing to do. Uh, using Gen AI for that is just fine, and they get instructor feedback on their outline, usually related to scope, uh, focus, things like that. Then the final step is the delivery of the elements of the project. The ethical project itself, in which they're allowed to use generative AI freely, is graded partly on its content and partly on the ability of the students to surpass in depth and subtlety the Gen AI speech that they gave in stage four. And the second thing is uh, after that, they need to produce a pitch video and they can use Gen AI for that as well. And um, to explain the ethics project to a target audience, this ethics project is supposed to be something they can immediately use in the world, like a workshop for a specific group of people or something like that. So the, the video that they create is essentially a pitch trying to attract people to pay attention to this thing and show up for this workshop or whatever it might be. And then finally, there's a class presentation based around the pitch video, which is very likely to have been produced using Gen AI. 
So the various steps of this project um, enable me to do something that I can't normally do when I'm doing separated projects. And that is evaluate the quality of production based on things that they did using Gen AI only. So I can get a sense for how much deeper they can go. They get a sense for how much deeper they can go. And uh, to a person in the class, I believe they're experiencing the limitations of generative AI and its excitement and are finding positive ways to use it. The feedback I'm getting is that this is helping them a lot to figure out how Gen AI is going to function in their lives going forward while still producing good products that activate their skill sets to a maximal degree. So I'm pretty pleased with it as an approach and I plan to use it again. Thank you, Wesley, for your discussion. And as this multimodal and multi-layered approach, um, there's so many more areas that we can explore further uh, in the Q&A. So folks, just to remind you, you can put uh, questions into the Q&A at any time, um, and we'll look forward to addressing those um, very soon. Um, our next slide, please. So one of the frequent questions that we get here in CTL is in response to generative AI uh, in our higher education landscape is, can I just use an AI checker? So here to tell us more about that question and how we handle it is Lisa Burgess, uh, Assistant Director for the Centre for Teaching and Learning. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Deb. Uh, next slide, Sam. So AI checkers were introduced pretty quickly after ChatGPT hit the scene and, and everyone was really concerned about student use of ChatGPT or other generative AI tools. And so AI checkers became pretty popular pretty quickly, uh, but one of there were several problems with them. And I wanted to first kind of give you two of the major parameters that are used with AI checkers to explain what some of the problems, they kind of, it kind of explains what some of the problems are with these checkers. So two very common parameters are the two most basic parameters used by these AI checkers to determine if written content is AI created or human created are known as perplexity and burstiness. Um, in perplexity, it's a mathematical measurement and it's gonna, the model returns how confident it is in the prediction of specific text. So if there is written content that has a, has a very low perplexity score, this is likely because it was written by AI. AI, generative AI, tends to use low perplexity in its writing simply for fluency and coherence. Whereas human writing is much more unpredictable, it has a higher perplexity score more often, and this is due to creativity, also, also uh, grammatical error or spelling errors, and language choice, what vocabulary they might be using. In burstiness, we look at sentence structure and variation in the actual length of a sentence. In AI writing, something that may look intuitive, you may intuitively think that it is AI writing, but not really understand why you recognize it as AI is usually because of sentence length. The sentences, sentences oftentimes have a very similar length and very similar structure. Whereas in humor, human writing, again, being unpredictable, we're gonna have a variation in the length of sentences as well as in the actual sentence structure itself. This is usually due to creative choices um, and expression by the author themselves. So next slide, Sam. Here at BU, we do use Turnitin and Turnitin was one of the earliest uh, introducers of an AI checker, particularly in their plagiarism tool. And it was introduced uh, very quickly before we really understood how bias was being introduced into some of these. So BU actually decided to turn off the AI checker uh, that's available in Turnitin for three very uh, important reasons. The first was bias against non-native speakers. Non-native speakers in their writing, there would also be non-native uh, language authors, would have a lower perplexity score and lower burstiness. They're gonna use more predictable language in their writing as they are learning the nuances of the language that they are authoring in. So this introduces a bias towards non-native speakers and non-native uh, writers, non-native language writers or authors might have those lower scores. This would give us a false positive on some of their, their work. There was the accuracy rate being very questionable. Um, right now, shorter lengths have about a 4% uh, 
uh, like less than a page, maybe one or two paragraph length writing, will have about a 4% false positive rate in Turnitin, which may not seem like a lot, but if you have 100 students in your course, you're now, you could possibly, you know, falsely accuse some of those students of AI writing when you ask them specifically not to use it. Uh, on longer samples greater than a page, it's running about 1%, but still, you would, uh, as faculty, we certainly don't want to um, falsely accuse a student. With that uh, questionable rate, it's important to remember that uh, AI checkers are not necessarily going to be consistent. They're not de dependable. And if a student is accused, the only evidence a faculty member could bring to, say, a grade appeal or a conversation uh, meeting with the student would simply just be a probability. There's no evidence of misuse or academic dishonesty like you might have in plagiarism. So it's not a true plagiarism checker. Uh, and if you're a faculty member that's having that conversation with a student, you want to make sure that you understand that what you're presenting to them is really just a probability and not really true evidence. Next slide. So to kind of give a, a little bit of an idea of how a false positive might work here, we have two, two separate paragraphs. They are both based on um, both of these paragraphs are describing the way to introduce tone into your class using a motivational syllabus. And uh, one of these was written with ChatGPT. The other was written with, uh, it was actually human writing that was written long before ChatGPT was introduced. So you might take a look at these and it may even seem almost um, easy to determine. Uh, just kind of take a look at them very quickly and kind of in your mind, just say, oh, I know which one is AI, which one is not. Uh, next, Sam. Next. So with these two paragraphs, the one on the left is an excerpt from an actual book that was written in 2018. And on the right is a ChatGPT response. This is just a straight output from a very simplified uh, prompt uh, that I put into ChatGPT. Next, Sam. What was interesting is I selected two AI checkers that are pretty commonly used. They're pretty well known, AIwriter.com, and the other is the, I think it's Scriber or Scriber, I, mean, I might be Scriber. Uh, and both of these falsely detected the human writing for a high probability of being AI generated. Now this is a small sample size and in a small paragraph, but I just wanted to show that even if you were using this, say for a short essay question or something like that, you could, possibly introduce uh, uh, a false accusation of AI use when you weren't expecting it. Uh, another problem with AI checkers is that the AI content itself is going to rapidly improve over time. And the more information that we put into it, the more it's being used, which is being used at a really high rate, the better these models are going to get at simulating human writing and the more difficult it will be for AI checkers to actually detect uh, human versus AI. And this makes reflecting on how and what we assess when using these assignments, why those things uh, become even more important in the future. Next slide. Okay, Deb. Yeah, thanks so much, Lisa, um, for that snapshot, especially I think that last comparative example was really enlightening. So thank you for that. Um, so folks, we are going to turn to the Q&A um, now and we have a couple of um, questions in the in our um, Q and A bubbles, and so I'm going to start with those. And I have some other questions as well. But as as folks talk, if you would like to add to the Q and A, please just go ahead. Um, so our first question is for Mohan from Mohanad, and I think um, I'm, I'm going to direct this question to both Margaret and Wes. And here's Mohanad's question. He says he's noticed that when allowed to use ChatGPT to get boilerplate code or a draft, many students get into copy paste mode with almost no compensation. So he says he doesn't want to ban the use of generative AI, but, but would like to know what, what are your thoughts on the best practices to make sure they have to understand what they're extracting from what's auto-generated. So Margaret and, and then Wes, I thought uh, your assignments uh, being uh, more writing based, um, that might be something to that you could respond to. Sorry, I meant comprehension, not conversation. I think we got it, but thank you, Mahanad, for that clarification. 
Um, I can start really quickly. Um, so, you know, um, I, I hear what you're saying, um, but my goal, especially with students who uh, in general do not have um, a, a comfort level with using code, you know, I always encourage my students, hey, if you can take a Python class, take a Python class. If you're interested in uh, visual effects or making a video game, why not try to learn Unity or Unreal Engine, what have you? And I also emphasize that every company uh, for, for a large part is a data company ultimately. So my number one goal with these students is I just want them to be comfortable using code. And uh, oftentimes they, they prefer not to. Um, and they, with this Twine example, twinery.org, very simple open source tool, uh, you know, they can pretty much figure it out on their own. Um, and, you know, and they said, what happens if, um, if, uh, you know, the use the uh, the chat GPT recommends incorrect code. And I, and I say, well, now you have an opportunity to figure out what they got wrong and try to debug the code. So for me, I I, I hear you. There is a concern about just the, the rote copy and pasting. I'm hoping that's going to open up a whole new world of curiosity for these students where they will go from perhaps using ChatGPT just to kind of copy and paste to just figuring out the hows and whys and maybe go a little bit deeper in terms of how they leverage tools such as Twine for um, their assignments and for life moving forward. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Wes, do you have a, a thought on Mohanad's question? The generative AI assistance policy that's been adopted within the Faculty of Computing and Data Sciences tries to deal with this a little bit by uh, asking for an appendix in which the students have to produce their AI usage, their actual usage. So you can always tell, oh, well, you can, if, so long as students are being honest, of course, you can tell the difference between what they produce and what the Gen AI gave them, which gives you at least some type of a metric. Um, the second thing that happens there is that students become aware of the fact that they're just copying and pasting, and that makes them more thoughtful about what they actually put into the final version of the assignment, uh, because they are documenting what they do in that appendix. And uh, Yet, even with those things, there's only so much you can do. This is going to be a perpetual problem, and in the real world of business, no one's going to care. So we're asking students to care about things that they're going to be encouraged to do in the business world and are starting to say things to us already like, why do you care about me being original when this boilerplate stuff can be produced so easily by anyone? It's just a complete waste of my time. I should be spending my effort on learning abilities on something else. So we have to actually rethink what our learning goals are, which takes us back all the way to what Chris started us off today with. Thanks, Wes, um, for that comment. And we, we do have a couple of questions here about tools being used in the classroom, but actually I'm just wondering, Yasith and um, the uh, second person who asked that question, if you just mind waiting just for a moment, because I'd like to pick up on, on something that Wes said about the responses he's getting from students and connecting it to Chris's um, point earlier about relevance and, and just turn to Tal um, in terms of, um, you know, you're teaching an MBA class um, and your students are in the workplace. And I'm just wondering, so two, two parts to this question. One, what responses are you getting from your students about the exercises that you are incorporating? But two, what are they telling you about what they're experiencing in the workplace? And I just wonder if you had a comment to follow up on Wes's point there. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't have a good answer. Uh, so I'm not being uh, like, I'm not talking too much about my process for coming up with questions. And so, so it's not really a topic for discussion with the students. Um, and then in terms of what they're dealing with on the other end, um, I, I teach a lot of healthcare students and there, there are confidentiality issues that prevent them from just using ChatGPT freely in the workplace. So I think it's kind of hit or miss and depends on the on the firm as to, to their experience in the workplace. But we haven't, you know, that hasn't been a big topic of discussion in the classroom. Okay, thanks, Tal. Um, so then maybe we will turn to this uh, quick quest, these two questions that we've got. And um, uh, folks, uh, Tal, Margaret, Wes, please, anyone or all of you could com comment on this. Um, so what 
AI tools do you use in your classrooms? And I guess that's for preparation as well as potentially for um, encouraging students uh, to integrate uh, in their work. Um, do you pay for them or do you expect students to pay to, for them or only use free tools? So what, what are the options there and which ones do you choose? Uh, uh I can just start really quickly. Uh, so uh, I do not expect students to pay for premium versions. Um, absolutely, they're um, encouraged to use uh, the variety of open AI tools. So ChatGPT, if they don't pay for the premium version, I think we're up to 3.5. Um, I discuss in the classroom the differences, the, qu the qualitative differences between the two, you know, the free version versus the premium version. I also encourage them to use Dolly, uh, the image generator, um, generative for images, also mid journey. And because I teach classes in interactive media and video games, uh, there are so many examples of ways in which creators are using generative AI tools to not only improve workflow and productions, but also in terms of things that we call in the world of games, we call NPCs, non-player characters. So I'll show them things like inworld.ai, um, which is a, a tool for um, creating natural, using natural language processing for um, uh, video game characters. Uh, and I'll also show them uh, other tools that are used um, in the world of games for um, creating uh, uh, games on the fly. So I, I don't expect them to pay for premium versions, um, but generally I, I stick to ChatGPT, Dolly, and MidJourney. Thanks, Margaret. Um, Wes, yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, there's there's so many. The uh, There are already, uh, um, at least six months ago, there were 100 Gen AI apps for producing text, and I think it's probably triple that now. There seems to be uh, a dozen or so coming out of every week. And the same is true for uh, images, videos, and different kinds of video Gen apps as well. Um, yeah, it's quite amazing. So there's a million things to choose from. Uh, but the sorts of things we seem to be using quite a bit, uh, if I'm asking students to think through how to communicate an idea or a policy or set up a nonprofit, what would that look like? Uh, I'll ask them to think in terms of using Mixio.io, which is a great site for uh, business startups to get you know, get an idea about how to set up a website and how to conceive the beginnings, at least, of a business plan. Um, and we're using uh, we're using a bunch of th things like um, tutorial uh, tutorai.me. That's a place where we've got our own tutors here that are built on ChatGPT, but Tutor AI allows you to build a, a tutor on just about anything. So I'm encouraging people by using them in class to say you can use a tutor to have a big impact on your learning on something that seems unfamiliar. So set one up and get to it and use it. ChatGPT does a pretty good job doing that all by itself. You tell it to play a character and you give it good prompts for that and, and it can help. But Tutor AI and a bunch of other things are helping people get there as well. And But, but after that, um, I give them a list of about 20 different Gen AI things for videos and uh, and uh, about the same number for audio and for images, and they use whatever they want. <laughs> it's all free, though. I don't expect them to pay for anything. They do get worried about the fact that some people have money to pay for the premium version, mm -hmm. ChatGPT and others don't. That does seem to be a distributive justice issue to me. But um, we, on the, the the AI task force in the university, we're trying to discuss this issue as a uh, as a problem that we need to deal with. Thanks, Wes, um, for those thoughts. And and actually, I'm wondering, Chris, uh, if we could connect to you in terms of um, the way that the um, Educational Technologies Governance Committee is thinking about, you know, how to look at tools. Can you can you give us an update on on what's happening there, please? Sure. Thanks a lot, Deb, for this. Um, we are about form, and and you know, Wesley, this is something that I was going to notify you via an email, and so so we're about to form in a generative AI Educational Technologies Subcommittee. 
Uh, this will uh, involve uh, members of the various tech organizations in our various campuses. Uh, the goal of this subcommittee is to be monitoring um, developments in the space of educational technology tools, uh, primarily so that we understand how the various uh, technologies we centrally support are integrating AI and whether those new capabilities uh, require or either create any risks or raise any issues that we need to deal with. Uh, and secondarily, to also be looking at what vendors that we're not currently supporting are producing and maybe identifying uh, technologies and tools that we should consider um, piloting or integrating into what we offer here at BU. This is, as I said, this is something which is about to be announced. Um, yeah, that's that's what I can share with you right now. Thank you, Chris, and sorry to preempt that announcement. Um, the next question from um, Marsha is uh, from a teaching a MET class, uh, and she's just wondering about, and I'm just going to, you know, um, uh, summarize this here rather than read the whole question. She's thinking that ChatGPT could certainly create questions um, that could uh, um, be intersposed into quizzes, but she's also wondering about other interactive quiz tools in the marketplace that could present questions to individual students as a low impact assessment. Lisa, do you want to take that very quickly or is this something you would like to get back to Marsha on? Um, I can just mention real quick, uh, BU is going to be integrating uh, poll everywhere. So that would be a kind of a polling quizzing type question that you can use, but it wouldn't be individual to each student. It would be presented in class, then the students would respond individually. Um, if you're looking for students to, to interact with something, uh, what Wesley was talking about with the AI tutor is a great way to integrate students in that, um, in that realm as well. And then I can certainly take a look and, and get back to it with uh, other tools. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and I would just like to say um, in the questions remaining in the time we have, Damon, I think your question was probably answered to some degree um, with Chris's explanation of the subcommittee. So um, we'll leave that one for now. Um, and then we have, I think we have got more questions that we can now get to. And this often happens that folks kind of uh, really start digging in with their questions towards the end. But I think um, given that we ha have, a, you know, folks from a range of schools here, and uh, I think the question that I would like to direct to our panel, uh, based on your experience so far using generative AI in the course design, um, and that's both, you know, Tal, in terms of your your thinking about how you prepare things, and then for Margaret and Wes in terms of integrating um, into um, assignments for students. What What's your thinking at the moment in terms of um, policies that might you know, come out of uh, your conversations with colleagues, your departments. We also know we have the the um, Provost um, Task Force, uh, of which Wesley is co-chair. So we certainly don't want to preempt the work of that. But I'm just kind of curious if you if you would like to sort of share some ideas on the things that you think both students potentially are looking for, as well as what your experiences directed you towards. Yeah, I, I serve on the uh, Crovost task force as well, and I, that's one thing we're we're grappling with, like what policy should be put in place uh, for uh, guidance for the entire university. I do have a colleague who's very concerned about his IP and using ChatGPT. Like, I think the the concern that he has is that he has terrific explanations or metaphors or or you know intellectual property, and he's pasting that into ChatGPT to create quizzes or do whatever, and then who knows what's going to happen to that IP and whether it's going to be incorporated into the next version and eventually be, you know, he's going to be competing with himself. Um, so that's, a, I think, a valid concern. Uh, it's worth reading the the kind of guidelines that OpenAI has in terms of what they, you know, how they train the model and what they promise to do or not do with the, the material you give it. Uh, for health-related information, HIPAA is is a huge issue. And so I think a doctor would have to be very careful and it might not be allowed to, to type in patients, you know, personal details into ChatGPT. And then FERPA also creates complications as well. Um, I think one concern we all have to grapple with is what happens when we end up maybe with some instructors at BU who are really using ChatGPT as a, as a crutch. 
and are teaching classes they're not prepared for or who aren't really vetting the output. And, and that would be a huge problem. If that problem already might exist with textbooks that people are using, leaning on textbooks too careful, too, too heavily and, and using uh, provided materials from, from publishers too heavily. But um, it's also a potentially bigger problem when it comes to generative AI. Thanks. Um, we are at time, but but Margaret and Wes, did, were there uh, any last comments that you wanted to make around that? Thank you so much, Tal, for that thoughtful answer. And then I'm just going to turn to our other two faculty presenters in case you have a quick comment. Nothing yeah. to uh, Tal covered that really well, I think. Thanks, Tal. I agree. I agree that, um, you know, um, my course class policy is um, unless you're given a specific permission to use it, please don't. And if you do, let me know and, and share your thought process around the use of it. Okay. So thank you so much to uh, all of our presenters. Uh, Chris has a, a comment, I think. I have a very quick comment. I noticed that a lot of the unanswered questions for today revolve around tools. And I just want to announce that uh, in the next year, we plan to have a session like this one dedicated to generative AI tools. So we hear you and, and we'll have a special session on this topic. Thanks, Chris. And and I think uh, the, uh, another remaining question is about um, accommodations for students. And I think just directing that again to the folks on our panel who are from the AI task force uh, in, in considerations. So uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks so much to all of our panelists and really appreciate uh, the time that you've um, put into both thinking about this, thinking about it with your students, um, being present today. Um, I think what I'm taking away from this is amongst all the concerns that students will lose their critical skills uh, in this new landscape of generative AI is what I'm hearing from all of you. But, and I think um, particularly from the, the assignments that Margaret and Wes talked about is how much critical thinking is really going to be so important as we move forward. So um, again, thank you. Uh, there will be a survey coming out just in terms of getting, We, do, as Chris said, we have a program organized for the spring uh, or conceptualized, and, but we'd love to hear your feedback as to what else you would like to learn together as we collectively think about generative AI um, at Boston University and in higher education in general. Thanks so much, folks. Um, take care and uh, we look forward to seeing you again.